Welcome to Displaced Gamers. My name is Chris, and this is Talk and Code Episode 3. Look for information on NES cartridge mappers today, and you'll probably find yourself landing on NestDev. When information was shared before the internet, Nintendo Power, of all things, was one way to find a few details on cartridge makeup. This is the January 1991 issue of Nintendo Power, Volume 20. If you know my content, you know that I find the technology timeline to be relevant whenever we speak of the past. As for where we are in January, it's all about the NES and Game Boy. We're hitting year 6 of the NES and the system is mature. Programmers have a good grasp on it and mapper chips are expanding the system's abilities. But the Sega Genesis has been on the scene for a couple of years now too. We often compare different systems by matching system bits to each other, like 16-bit systems. However, in terms of history at this moment, the Super Famicom has just been released in Japan and will take some time to ramp up its game library and receive its international release. So for the moment, it's NES versus Genesis in America. Sega Marketing is pushing Mega Bits as a gimmick for the games it releases. They've been printing the bits on the game clamshells and boxes for years now. The PC Engine has debuted as the TurboGrafx-16, and even the Neo Geo is flaunting bits as an easy way to claim superiority. The higher the number, the better the game, a marketing department's dream come true if you buy into the idea. Where does Nintendo stand on the numbers? This issue of their marketing magazine contains a four-page article called Why Your Game Packs Never Forget on page 28. It covers the differences between various NES cartridge types, including the mapper chips found inside them. If we skip forward to the end of the article, it says, The measure of any great game is not memory size or whether it uses an MMC1 or MMC5. The real test is whether or not it's fun to play. Disclaimer, this is speculation on my part, but I think Nintendo Power, which was a print media form of marketing for Nintendo, crafted this article for the magazine in response to the industry's pushing of bits to help showcase growth and superiority of games for competitors' systems. The Super Famicom and certainly the Super Nintendo were late to the party, and this article hits at a perfect time for Nintendo to try to bridge its 8-bit era to its 16-bit era by downplaying the numbers. Volume 20 does this on page 31, and then hypes up its new 16-bit system on page 95. Numbers don't matter, but by the way, we're moving to 16-bit and just need a little more time. Volume 20 feels like turning the pages of history, literally. Let's talk about this article, the cartridge configurations mentioned, and rip open some carts along the way. I'm not going to read this verbatim, so you may wish to Google Nintendo Power Volume 20 PDF and read pages 28 to 31 first. Let's get into the article. Why Game Packs Never Forget Nobody I know calls them Game Packs anymore, but I still refer to the NES system as the Control Deck. I also enjoy seeing names like Princess Toadstool and King Koopa from days gone by. I don't know what the average age of a reader of Nintendo Power was, but I imagine a lot of people, especially younger readers, skipped right over these four pages. Even though I coded for fun at the time, I don't think I read this because, quite simply, you couldn't run down to Radio Shack and buy an NES development kit, so who cares? A somewhat harsh response, but that was how I felt. The first configuration mentioned is NROM, and the article talks about how we evolved from here. The NES was designed so that the latest technology could be used in each new generation of game packs. It's like an RC car. When a faster motor comes out, you buy one and slap it in your old racer. Remote control cars were a pop culture toy thing at the time. You just had to have one. It may seem random today if you didn't live through it, but it was a good parallel for them to draw at the time. Anyway, Nintendo uses this analogy to explain adding newer chips to cartridges in order to push the system further. For the NROM, it provides the maximum sizes, 256K for program code and 64K for graphics. In a previous video, I said 32K for program code and 8K for graphics. And the difference here is that the Nintendo Power numbers and those of their competitors are given in bits rather than bytes because they're larger. They even mention the discrepancy in size, but then quickly eject from any further elaboration with, but size isn't everything. But let's get down to basics. The diagram below illustrates the relationship between the processor's RAM and chips in an NROM cartridge, and unfortunately, also contains a huge mistake. Do you see it? 
PPU, and CPU are switched. Otherwise, it does a decent job of simplifying how the NES interfaces with a cartridge that uses the NROM configuration. We can take a look inside Super Mario Bros. and see the program ROM, character ROM, CIC lockout chip, and the soldered pad that indicates the game is meant to scroll horizontally. This is a very simple, straightforward PCB configuration for NES games. Mario uses the maximum sizes for each, 32K, that's kilobytes, for the program ROM, and 8K for the character ROM. Let's move on. Stepping up with the UN ROM. The UN ROM game pack has a program ROM and a RAM chip. It explains, background and moving object characters for the current area of the game are stored in RAM, which is a more versatile method than storing everything in a ROM. In addition, the UN ROM allows greater memory size and a process called bank switching. They explain the bank switching in the next section along with an intro to the memory management controller, or MMC, chips. Let's check out their bank switching section before proceeding with UN ROM. Nintendo Power illustrates the concept of bank switching by comparing it to adding pages in a book in order to tell a better story. One page can hold so much and at some point you need another page to expand the story. It refers to different banks as different programs, and you will automatically switch to the appropriate program when you reach a new area of the game. Ideally, this would be true. However, we know from taking a look at some MMC1 bank switching in previous episodes that there isn't a natural progression to the process. Moving from area A to area B in a given game does not mean a simple, single bank switch like turning the page in a book. We jump around a lot. Zelda changes banks multiple times per frame. Zelda 2 not only does this, but would seem to be unoptimized when it comes to bank layout and therefore bank switching. So this first paragraph is a good start of an analogy, but doesn't tell the whole tale. Understandable though, this magazine is Nintendo Power. Simple is better. The second paragraph brings up how memory management controllers came about and how Nintendo integrated logic gates into a custom chip. MMCs are smaller, cheaper, allow for battery-backed RAM for saved games, and more. Finally, the It's Only Logical diagram shows these logic gates on the left side, and on the right side they show an MMC chip and how all of those inputs and outputs can be integrated into the circuit using a single chip. Let's stick to logic gates and return to the UNROM configuration that uses them. The diagram shows the CPU having its usual communication with the program ROM, which in this case will contain the graphics for the game as well. So the game can load initial graphics from the program ROM and place it in character RAM via the PPU by way of PPU registers. The article cites Fire Pro Wrestling as an example game, but I'm going to look elsewhere. This is Castlevania. If we look inside, name table mirroring is configured by soldering H or V for horizontal and vertical scrolling, just like with an NROM. Castlevania scrolls horizontally. Most retail configurations from back in the day are going to have 128K, like Castlevania seen here, with some pushing into 256K territory. Next to the program ROM is 8K of character RAM. As you can see, the PCB can use chips of different physical sizes here. The CIC lockout chip to the left is standard fare. That leaves these two chips here, an LS161, a 4-bit binary counter, and an LS32, a quad input OR gate. This is your mapper chip configuration built from these two logic gates that allow for bank switching. And speaking of buying things at Radio Shack, these are off-the-shelf parts. Okay, let's pick up MMC chips on page 30. Many of the classic games like The Legend of Zelda and Metroid became possible only after the MMC1 was developed. The asterisk here would be became possible on a cartridge only after the MMC1 was developed, as they were originally made for the Famicom Disk System. It does mention how Metroid can scroll both horizontally and vertically. That is definitely an advantage to MMC1 as scrolling or mirroring is controlled in software and is no longer defined by bridging two connections on a PCB. Speaking of which, if we look inside Zelda, we have six main components. The program ROM, two instances of SRAM, one used to hold graphics that have been loaded from ROM, and a second that holds save game information as well as code loaded from ROM, and we covered that trivia in episode two, a battery to preserve that SRAM, the CIC lockout chip, and last but not least, the MMC1 mapper chip. This PCB configuration is SNROM. With that in mind, this is Metroid. If we open it up, SNROM PCB. 
Same board family as Zelda, same major components as Zelda, but the battery has been omitted along with two diodes and two resistors. In fact, you can tell your friends that R2-D2 is not in Metroid and you would not be lying. Anyway, this is interesting because the original Metroid on the Famicom Disk System did allow players to save their games with three slots, just like Zelda. Could that functionality have been retained with battery-backed RAM in a cartridge? Probably. There are ROM hacks out there that add a save game feature to Metroid, and also an in-game map, among other things, which is kind of cool. But regardless, Metroid was reprogrammed as a password game for its MMC1 cartridge release. Let's move to MMC2. This article states that, to date, only one game has been designed for use with MMC2, and that game is Punch-Out!, the main point it makes is that the game program has a great number of variations, which requires extra memory. The cartridge is pretty basic fare. A program ROM, a character ROM, the CIC lockout, and the giant MMC2 chip. The character ROM here is 128K. The PPU can only see 8K of that at a time. That's a lot of stored graphics for use throughout the game. As you probably know, there are opponents of various sizes with different expressions and more in Punch-Out!, there's also a crowd in the upper part of the screen and the heads-up information. Also, this is a different set of graphics than this. Wow, there really are a lot of graphics needed just for a single fight. The primary feature of the MMC2 is that it allows the PPU to switch to an alternate 4K bank for each of the two banks it can address during rendering, meaning each of the two 4K banks can be switched while in the middle of outputting a frame of video, like a tag team. Better to illustrate this feature with graphics in-game instead of boxes, numbers, and lines. So, here we are in Mike Tyson's Punch-Out fighting Glass Joe at 1% emulation speed. You can see the character viewer tab of the PPU viewer. We have a 4K bank here and a 4K bank here. To the right under display options there is a character selection box. From here we can select different ranges of graphics contained inside the character ROM and they appear on the left. We can also choose to view the banks the PPU can currently see. And what the PPU can currently see is influenced by this value. At which scan line do we want to examine the PPU's character banks? At the moment, it is scan line 241 at the end of a frame. Glass Joe and Little Mac are the most recent graphics that are relevant. However, if we change the scan line value to examine what the PPU sees while drawing the upper third of the screen, scan line 60 for example, the bottom bank contains graphics for numbers and the crowd. The game switches that bank from crowd to little Mac in the middle of drawing the current frame. If we set the scan line to 200 and just play the game, you can see the bank switching happening on a frame by frame basis as the poses change. Swapping graphics is a critical component of punch out and can happen thanks to the MMC2. Next up is the MMC3. The article highlights split-screen scrolling and scrolling at an angle as two features of the mapper. Super Mario Bros. 3 is a good example for both. Nintendo has a history of vaulting tech demos into games when they launch new technology. Mode 7 is a graphics mode of the Super Nintendo that received a lot of promotion as an easy term to use to describe the system's scaling and rotation features. F-Zero and Pilot Wings are great ambassadors for the introduction of this ability, and they do so in a rather obvious manner. But perhaps an overlooked showcase of abilities arrived with Super Mario Bros. 3 and the MMC3 mapper chip it used. While not the first MMC3 game, Mario 3 demonstrates diagonal scrolling in the first level by design. As far as I am concerned, this game is also a technical showcase. In 1985, Mario 1 can scroll in one direction. In 1986, Metroid can scroll in four directions, but can only scroll one axis at a time. In 1988, Mario 3 adds the Super Leaf power-up in the first level, turns Mario into Raccoon Mario, and allows him to fly. Does he fly in a single direction? No, he flies at an angle, and showcases multi-directional scrolling on the NES. While Mode 7 sticks out as a graphic style of sorts, multi-directional scrolling in Mario 3 and other games is most likely overlooked today, even by those that played the game when it was first released. A second feature of the MMC3 is the ability to generate an interrupt for a given scan line. A great tech demo for this is the lineup game. Multi-directional scrolling is performed thanks to using this interrupt multiple times per frame in order to know which scan line we are on as the graphics are drawn to the screen. For this minigame in particular, it waits until scan line 32, 
An interrupt signals the appropriate number of scan lines that have been rendered, and the game knows it's time to draw the top third of the puzzle. A new scan line counter is set to wait to signal the next interrupt, and the top third of the puzzle is drawn in the meantime. Once that count has expired, it's time to draw the middle third. The same process is used to time the lower third and the rest of the screen can be drawn. In addition to drawing unique graphics for the current third being rendered while waiting on the next interrupt to occur, the game also scrolls in the desired direction. Left for the top, right for the middle, left for the bottom. Scanline 32 is hard-coded into the logic to signal the start of the puzzle. The sizes for each third of the puzzle in terms of scan lines are provided in the ROM in these three locations. The size of each third is equal, of course. That also means that we can manipulate the desired scan line count. If we reduce the top scan line count from 52 to 32, the top third is reduced in size. Take what we removed from the top third and add it to the middle third, and now we've compensated for the overall puzzle size. Each of the three sections now has a unique size, easily accomplished with a couple of Game Genie codes. Finally, if we look inside Mario 3, you can see how the MMC3 has a different pin package and perhaps gets its hooks into more of the system. In addition, we see the 256K program ROM, 128K character ROM, CIC lockout, and an additional 8K of work RAM. And now it's time for the MMC5, an absolute beast. Nintendo Power hits on some of the very easy to explain features courtesy of this chip. To cover this mapper alone may require multiple videos in the future due to its feature set. As a matter of fact, <laughs> here is a list of features from the NestDev wiki. Some of them are natural extensions of those on previous MMC chips. Nintendo Power points out the following. Improved battery backup system including not having to hold in reset and hit power off. When you power off the NES, the processor continues to run for just a little bit and can corrupt save data on an MMC1-based battery game. The solution was to hold in reset to halt processor execution and then press power off. The MMC5's design dropped the need for this fix. Nintendo Power also mentions a custom mathematics module that frees up the control deck's CPU from some repetitive functions such as running an internal clock. I think they may have used clock where timer would have been more appropriate even though the timer is based on clock cycles. The MMC5 also adds the ability to multiply two numbers together. Two 8-bit unsigned numbers can be written to register 5205 and 5206, and the 16-bit result will be immediately available to be read from those same locations. Remember, the 6502 in the NES does not have native multiplication, so this feature can certainly save some time from doing manual multiplication via looping. Vertical split-screen scroll. We saw horizontal split-screen scrolling earlier, an example of vertical split-screen scrolling, and perhaps the only one, would be SDF. Aside from mentioning its ability to address much larger ROMs, the article points out how better color definition is possible. This one is pretty self-explanatory thanks to the illustration with an MMC5 color area versus regular color area. It uses this screen from Castlevania 3 as an example. I feel like perhaps any details about this would be best included in a separate video about pattern tables. Inside Castlevania 3, you will find the 256K program ROM, 128K character ROM, CIC lockout chip, and the very fancy MMC5 chip. Lots of traces, lots of connections, kind of looks like the time when the board took over engineering. Finally, they do a small write-up about how save RAM is backed up using a battery. You don't need me to comment any more on that. Compression is mentioned, which is also rather self-explanatory. And mask ROMs versus EPROMs and programmable ROMs. The article states that there is, or was, a misconception that game cartridges could write to the ROMs, and I guess this was an opportunity for them to clear that up. As for this last blurb, the bottom line, we covered that earlier. I hope this video gave you some behind the scenes information for this article, answered some questions, <laughs> and maybe even created new ones. I have plenty of more content on the way. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more. I also have a Patreon available, and thanks for watching.